This week, Siskel and Ebert review. John Travolta, Gene Hackman, and Danny DeVito in the gangland comedy Get Shorty. Demi Moore and Melanie Griffith remember one golden summer in Now and Then. Plus, Nicole Kidman, Brad Pitt, and Sandra Bullock in the films that made them stars. Travolta plays a mob loan collector who takes a liking to the movie business in Get Shorty. One of the new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Cisco and Ebert, and also a movie that suggests it stars Demi Moore and Melanie Griffith, but does it. And we'll also take a special look at three new stars, Brad Pitt, Nicole Kidman, and Sandra Bullock, and the movies that fueled their stardom. Why these roles? Why start them now? I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is Get Shorty, and it's based on a very funny Elmore Leonard novel about a Miami loan shark who goes to Los Angeles to collect on a mob debt and ends up in the movie business. Leonard is famous for his dialogue, and one of the best things about this movie is the way that they use a lot of it, and they don't dumb it down either. Listen to this scene. There's a Miami guy played by John Travolta talks to another local mafioso whose nose he broke in a fight over a leather jacket. But now Travolta's godfather is dead, and the other hood, played by Dennis Farina, explains the new reality. Bomo is dead, which means that everything he had now belongs to Jimmy Cap, including you, which also means that when I speak, I speak for Jimmy. E.G., from now on, you start showing me the proper respect. E.G. means, for example, what I think you want to say is I believe it's short for ergo. Ask your man. To the best of my knowledge, E.G. means, for example. I love that exchange, and I also like the dialogue in Los Angeles when Travolta turns up in the middle of the night to intimidate a sleazy movie producer about his sizable casino debt. Have we met? I, I don't recall. We just did. I told you my name's Chili Palmer. See your picture, right? You ever stop to think what would happen if I had a heart attack? Of course, that's Gene Hackman as the producer there, and what happens is they start talking, and Travolta realizes he'd rather be in the movie business than the loan shark business as he faces down another wannabe producer, a drug dealer played by Delroy Lindo. It says here you're getting Martin Weir for the part of Love Jewel. That's right, we're getting Martin. Come on. How are you going to do that? I'm going to take a gun, I'm going to put it to his head, and I'm going to say, son of Papers, Martin, are you dead? That's it. I wonder, would that work? Now, this is one of the funniest scenes in the whole movie. Travolta has hooked up with Renee Russo as a B-movie actress, and they go to visit her ex-husband to convince him to be in their movie. He's a big star, played by Danny DeVito. Pretend this. You're a Shylock. Mm -hmm. The guy owes you 15 grand. He skips town, he takes off. What are you doing? Uh, uh, uh. Oh, Martin, for f***'s sake. <sighs> just, just, you know. I'm doing Shylock <laughs> instead of us Shylock. Right. All right, well, what's my motivation? And the movie just goes on like that. It's like Pulp Fiction in that it's almost as much fun to listen to as it is to watch. The actors have a great time with their roles, with Travolta as the mob guy who thinks fast and realizes that, hey, making bad movies isn't too much different from committing any other crime. DeVito has fun playing a star with an oversized ego, and Gene Hackman, who I didn't recognize at first behind the beard and those buck teeth, makes a convincing exploitation movie maker because he sees it as a business, not a scam, and is very serious about his terrible films. Get Shorty is one of the strangest movies ever made about Hollywood and one of the funniest. It's funny in a light, breezy way. This yeah. is, you compare it to Pulp Fiction, I think it would like to be that good. It isn't in that mm -hmm. caliber. Uh, the dialogue sometimes seems a little bit forced clever with some of the people knowing references that I don't think these characters might know. But it is, what I enjoyed is the story construction because it's layered like a mosaic and then all of a sudden, at the very end, we get 
the big picture. For example, you have that uh, scene involving, the whole series of scenes involving the stuff that's in the locker out at the airport. Right. And the way so many people go up to that locker and try to figure out what right. to do about that locker, whether to open it, whether to yeah. send somebody But it hasn't else. been organized in a literary fashion where you're, where, where it's that's the goal. It's a delight to see the story unfold. And once yeah. again, that Belmore Leonard's construction, yeah. and I think they were very wise to keep so much of the book. Good idea. Now, our next movie is a film called Now and Then, a film that got me a little angry before boring me. It's a coming-of-age story about young girls growing up in the 70s, but it's told in flashback by the girls now grown up. The adults are played by Demi Moore, Melanie Griffith, Rosie O'Donnell, and Rita Wilson. But anyone led to expect through advertising or the film's opening credits to see a film about adults and children will be sorely misled. The older characters in Now and Then are there just to open and close the film. So you sit there through this cutesy little girl story waiting for the adults to return, and they just don't until basically the end of the picture. Here are the grown women as they come together for a reunion because one of their gang is about to have a baby. Technically, I have only been married three times. The first one was no. See? <laughs> oh, you do think everything is so funny. If you ask me, you both need to grow up. Now the movie flashes back to 1970 as the four girls engage in, well, adolescent girl talk. Have you ever been French kissed? Are you kidding? I don't want to get pregnant. One good scene when one of the girls, played by Gabby Hoffman, tries to deal with her parents' divorce. She gets some good advice from a character played by Thora Birch. This is one of the normal family, you know. It's a Brady bunch. Well, six kids sharing one bathroom, not so much underneath. Most of Now and Then is just sincere psychobabble as the film eventually, but much too late, returns to the older women. I've had how many relationships in how many years? And I've run from every one of them. I wanted more screen time of the grown women, in part because the girl's story was so inconsequential with early dating scenes and a cornball mystery involving a dead child and a creepy old man. Now and then should be more accurately titled just then. That would be honest, but it still wouldn't get me to recommend it. Well, I didn't like it either, Gene, but I certainly didn't want to see more of the adult actresses. <laughs> I wanted to see nothing of the adult actresses because they have nothing to do with the story. Now, obviously, the antecedent of this film is Stand By Me, which right. began and ended with Richard Dreyfuss remembering what happened with those young boys many years ago. But here, the story should have been the young actresses. They're good in the film. They're all good actresses they in many other films, actresses. too. They could have been given a better story and just go ahead and do it instead of this false advertising and this strange construction. Let me tell you, I asked Demi Moore, who is the producer on this picture, mm -hmm. why the film, in the opening credits, List the actresses, first the grown actresses, yeah, and then the uh -huh. girls, setting up an equivalency. Or actually suggesting that maybe the gr it's the adult story and not the girl story. Yeah. Her answer was, we needed to show who was who. We had so many questions in test screenings about who was going to be... You know what? Who cares? Who no cares one would have cared. If the who? story had more substance to it, I don't think people would be asking that question. Okay, when we come back, a special report. Three stars who have found exactly the right role at exactly the right time. Nicole Kidman, Brad Pitt, and Sandra Bullock. But first... Shannon Doherty in Mallrats. You sure you saw her get on, right? Maybe she was getting off. You won't actually tell my mother what we do in here at night? What, that you play video games and I fall asleep unfulfilled? Our next film is Mallrats, a dismal would-be comedy about kids hanging out at the mall. And I was caught by surprise by this picture when I realized it was made by the same director who made one of the freshest films of last year, Clerks. It's about 24 hours in the raunchy, freaky, and boring lives of a convenience store clerk and his best friend who mans the video store hey. next door. Brody man, Nucci Nucci. This time director Kevin yes, Smith sets his picture in a shopping lost. mall and the edginess of clerks is lost as two young men try to regain the affection of their girlfriends. Here's a sample of the dreary comedy as the boys meet up with a couple of wacky friends at the mall. So I was just telling T.S. here we gotta find Jay and Silent Bob. If there's anyone that can help us out, it's the two guys that have even less to do than us. What is it? Everyone's looking for us today. We're Duck and Trisha because she wants to talk to Obi-Wan here about her video setup. Why him? Silent Bob's an electrical genius. He won the science fair in eighth grade by turning his mom's vibrator into a CD player using some chicken wire. It's not much better with the women in the picture. The sex jokes are totally lame between Jason Lee and his girlfriend, Shannon Doherty. Too little? You said it was a good size. The effort, you retard. The effort was too little too late. But now that you mention it, and a girl says it's a good size. It's a nice place, only it's small. 
I sat stone-faced throughout Mallrats, not laughing once. I couldn't believe it was the same talent involved that made Clerks. Maybe it's the sophomore jinx, maybe a bigger budget, but the salesmen and clerks were alive and unpredictable. The consumers in mall rats are stale, recycled gag machines. Rent clerks instead of seeing mall rats. I'm totally in agreement with you on this, and what you miss in this film is the sense of immediacy and danger yeah. and things happening right now. Yeah. The thing about clerks, which cost, I don't know, $24,000, is that you sat there for an hour and a half and you were involved you were in, in the, the lives store. of these people. The dialogue sounded real, the situations right. developed in a way that was both comic and convincing. Right. And here it's just all sitcom. I completely agree. Coming up next, we're going to look at some good movies. Movies that made actors into stars. Why these roles? A special report on star-making roles next. <laughs> from the WWE and Weather Center. Weather Center? And now, star-making roles. A special report on actors who find the right role at the right time. That was Nicole Kidman in To Die For, an Oscar-caliber role that is causing so much talk that it ignited her career and made the movie industry forget, for the time being anyway, that she's Mrs. Tom Cruise. Kidman plays a publicity-crazed local cable TV weather woman in the movie which is a savage attack on celebrity and what some people will do to obtain it. Kidman started acting as a teenager in her native Australia, and her first internationally acclaimed role was at the age of 22 in Dead Calm, a thriller where she played a woman threatened by a madman in the middle of the ocean. What are you doing? No. My favorite Kidman performance before To Die For was in Flirting, where she played an older girl at a private school who gives some heartfelt advice to a classmate in love. Kidman met future husband Tom Cruise when they made the racing picture Days of Thunder together in 1990. What are you thinking? Just how much I'd like to know what you're thinking. Her name recognition increased with her role as a sexy criminal psychologist in the box office hit, Batman Forever. He's trying to get under my cape, Doctor. <sighs> a girl can't live by psychosis alone. So, at the age of 29, Nicole Kidman was well known. She was working, but she was in her husband's shadow until To Die For came along and showcased her talent for comedy and satire. It's nice to live in a country where life, liberty, and all the rest of it still stand for something. I think what happens when we see an actor in a role like that is we say to ourselves, so that's who she is. I hadn't much noticed Nicole Kidman before because she was often in absolutely standard roles that a lot of different people could have played. To Die For makes her special because I can't think of anyone else in this role. It's a turning point in her career. I think your general theory is right. When we see an actress or an actor and they break through, there's something in them that's in this character. And maybe Nicole Kidman is very funny in private life. But Roger, I think this is really just a great performance. And I shouldn't even put the words great in because she was superb in dead comedy as a thriller. She was wonderful in flirting. I think she's going to do, I don't think this is who she is. I think what she's really shown us is she's a superb actress and uh, she can do comedy. When I say, so that's who she is, I don't mean she is the woman in To Die For. I mean, she is now a performer that I can recognize in terms well, of kinds of skills yeah. that weren't really this showcased earlier. Well, this is a movie that's not about her and somebody else. This is about her. And That's so right. she's center screen. Coming up next, another actor who shot to stardom with the right role. We'll look at the career of Brad Pitt when we come back. Have you ever seen anything like this? I'm sick of all this waiting. This is the job. Why are we out there? Why, why do we got to sit here rotting, waiting until the lunatic does it again? Okay, continuing our special section on star-making roles. Next under the stardom microscope is William Bradley Pitt, a heartthrob who helped make the urban thriller Seven a smash hit. But we first noticed him back in 1991, such ancient history yeah. here, as a petty crook who seduces Gina Davis in Selma and Louise. And I just kind of waltz on in and I say, Ladies, gentlemen, let's see who wins the prize for keeping their cool. Simon says, everybody down on the floor. Now, nobody lose their head, then nobody lose their head. 
A following year, he was memorable as one of the sensitive brothers in Robert Redford's film of A River Runs Through It. Here is where Brad Pitt started to show his soul. Uh, you know the house rules as good as I do, Paul. No engines. Period. I just flat don't like the house rules, Murph. The next year, Brad Pitt stood out in true romance as a space cadet too stoned to recognize that the men looking for his roommate are mobsters. Well, they were here, and they said that they were going to go there. And they went. Yeah? Yeah. Safari, Safari Motel. Safari Motel. Uh -huh. Pitt also was excellent in California as a killer who bums a ride with a journalist. You know, anybody who took that much time and care bisecting another human being Bisect. must have been... You know, he cut him in two. Oh, we hacked him up? But I think the movie that made Brad Pitt a star was Edgewick's Legends of the Fall, a surprising success attributed to Pitt's charisma as he played a free spirit in a family of three brothers all in love with the same woman. This is Finn Cannon. It's a pleasure to meet you. I hope you and Ugly here find every happiness together. Legends of the Fall got a lot of bad reviews, not from me, but the reason it worked with audiences is that Pitt's persona in the film reminded many people of James Dean, the renegade freedom, the decency, the rigorous honesty in the face of deception. This may sound corny, but I believe the connection that excited audiences in Legends of the Fall is that Brad Pitt himself somehow contains those very same good character traits. He's hardly just a pretty boy. He's strong and grounded and independent, and audiences, both male and female, respond to that in Legend of the Fall. I think he's going to be around for a very long time. Well, I agree with you that it was that movie that really called his attention to the mass American yeah. audience and said, boy, here is a real movie star. Yes. For me, at least, it was California, the previous film, which I put on my list of the ten best films of the year, that really was his breakthrough performance in my mind, because there I said, boy, this is not just another young actor. He is very talented, and in California, he was electrifying. He is. I think he shows more colors in Legends of the Fall, and you're right. This is a star-making role. When we come back, Sandra Bullock, an actress who found two perfect roles in a row. Continuing our special report on the right roles at the right time, no one on this program has had a more spectacular and sudden career rise than Sandra Bullock, who had two perfect roles in a row. Her first was in Speed, the non-stop 1994 thriller, where she somehow managed to be likable, vulnerable, and plucky while driving a bus that would explode if she drove it slower than 50 miles an hour. Um, stay on or get off? Stay on or get off? Then, oh. next movie, in While You Were Sleeping, she played a ticket seller for the rapid transit who saves a man's life, is mistaken for his fiancée while he's in a coma, and then secretly falls in love with his brother. Listen, do you think you can find me a nice girl for Jack? Oh, Mom, come on. Well, I, I, I really don't know Jack's type, so I... Two perfect roles, but what did she do before? Well, in 1993, Sandra Bullock was in the little teen drama Wrestling Ernest Hemingway, where she played a waitress who catches the eye of a shy retiree played by Robert Duvall. And you? You know you're breaking my heart sitting here in Bernice's section when there's a table opened up in mine? <laughs> yes. <laughs> She's charming there, and also the same year she was cast as Sylvester Stallone's partner and love interest in the sci-fi police thriller Demolition Man. Mr. Sherlock, we'll be getting a few seconds. You do what? Having sex, of course. I think it's safe to say that Sandra Bullock isn't really an action star or a sex symbol. She's a sweetheart. She's one of the most extraordinarily likable actresses on the screen, but until she got those likable and high-profile roles, how are we supposed to know or even guess that? She was effective in wrestling Ernest Hemingway, but who saw it? You have to give a lot of credit to the people who cast her in speed and trusted that her warmth and charm would come across when she and Keanu Reeves were fighting to outwit the mad bomber. And somehow, in the middle of all that action, she actually succeeds in being subtle about the fact that she's falling in love. You know, I uh, made a comment when that film was first out, Speed, that. Uh, naturally, uh, he's drawn, Keanu Reeves is drawn to the prettiest woman on the bus and mm -hmm. saying that there was no competition. I think that she benefited from that. There was nothing else to distract you. At the Except same for the fact that the bus was going to blow up. I'm talking about in terms of other people. So, okay. you, so, so suddenly she becomes the, the someone, and uh, I think you're right, sweetheart. This is someone who, and it's what the best actresses have, mm -hmm. and I don't think you can learn it, 
You see them, you want them to be happy. No, if, if she's, no, unha she's, right about she's that. unhappy at the beginning of her pictures and she's happy at the end you're of the right pictures, about that we want to move her from A to B. While you were sleeping was such an obvious film. There wasn't a person in the audience that didn't know more or less what was going to happen. And to my amazement, after sitting there for That's the right. first reel cynically, That's right. I Same found city. myself drawn right in. She does draw you right in, and I don't think they teach that in acting school. Now let's take another look at the new movies we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs up for Get Shorty, the off-the-wall comedy starring John Travolta as a mobster on the make in Hollywood. Roger liked it a little bit more than I did. Two thumbs down for Now and Then, the juvenile story of friendship among young girls. And two more thumbs down for Mall Rats, the thoroughly unfunny comedy about guys hanging out in the local shopping center. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including Vampire in Brooklyn, starring Eddie Murphy, stalking New York detective Angela Bassett. I would love to have you for dinner. And also Copycat, starring Holly Hunter as a San Francisco cop teaming up with criminal psychologist Sigourney Weaver on the case of an inventive killer. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. check dairies where the check in the queue tells you our higher standards mean fresh taste glade basics air freshener for pure clean simple freshness available in spray and plug-ins refills fresh from glade st johnson wax show me a grilled cheese sandwich and i melt but what about all that fat well alpine lace took care of that with this delicious fat free singles no fat no fat no fat Thank you.